Today, I am joined again by Dr. Emma Cahill Marone and Mel Taylor to discuss portraits. Now, let's be honest, as history lovers, we relish the fact that we can look back in time and perhaps get a glimpse of the real people we've studied. But it's not always that easy, is it? The Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer. So no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's all totally free with no catch. I highly recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to spotify.com slash podcasters to get started. Small business owners, let's talk taxes. Did you know you could save up to 30% when you file with Block Advisors instead of a typical accountant? Block Advisors by H&R Block provides affordable tax expertise that finds every credit and deduction your business deserves. 100% accuracy guaranteed. Schedule an appointment today at blockadvisors.com slash smallbiz. Average savings based on national average fees for federal form 1040. Plus schedule C and one state filing in the latest available 2020 survey conducted by the National Society of Accountants. Pricing may vary. See blockadvisors.com slash guarantees for full details. The friendship is sharing deal. Because I want one of your McNuggets. And I need some of your quarter pounder. There's a deal for everyone at McDonald's. Get one favorite like 10-piece chicken McNuggets, a quarter pounder, or a Big Mac and get another for just a buck. Price and participation may vary. Valid for item of equal or lesser value. In our last episode, we talked about the significance of parrots and parrots in portraiture. And if you recall, I mentioned wanting to do another episode on exotic animals in portraits. Now, before we begin the discussion today, please note that there are links in the show notes to the images we are referencing today. If you're watching, well, then you'll see the visuals. Emma, Mel, welcome back. Hi. Hi. How are you, Rebecca? Oh, I'm fantastic. I get to talk to two of my favorite ladies today about a fascinating subject. Oh, Excellent. great. Well, <laughs> we like talking to you too. <laughs> I, I think it was pretty obvious from the previous uh, episode how how comfortable we were and we are talking to each other. So I'm very glad to be back. I, I just wanted to point out one little thing about the, the episode as I was listening to it and going through. And this is what happens when you are researching history. Sometimes things change. Sometimes you make mistakes. Um, in the previous episode, I mentioned a portrait of Mary Tudor, Catherine of Aragon, and Henry VIII's daughter holding a parrot in the inventory of Margaret of Austria. If if you can remember that, I mentioned that it was next to a portrait of Charles V. But I'm not quite sure right now if it's Charles V because the the description of that portrait prior to the one of Mary is somewhat ambiguous. So stay tuned. I'll, I'll let you know when when it's clarified. So I'm a, this is a, an inventory in French and it's old French, too. So sometimes these are tricky, you know, in the case of Mary, we do know it's her because um, the inventory says she's the daughter of the king of England, the modern one, because in the inventory, Henry VII is also mentioned as the previous, because of both Henry, right? They're not saying the number, they're just saying King Henry, the King of England, the modern one. So we know it's Mary Tudor, but um, and we know that she must be a child. So all I've been doing is uh, <laughs> researching to see if I can find this portrait. And a lot of the times we've lost these, but for sure we know <clears throat> that that was the case. Um, and I also wanted to, to point out something about, about the, the presence of a parrot. It seems like going back to the episode, like all the examples, uh, and you you can let me know about this. All the examples that we mentioned were um, were painted after 1524, when that portrait of Mary Tudor is present in Malin in the inventory of Margaret of Austria. So I'm starting to think: was this a model that was the, was a more than one portrait of Mary Tudor painted, and this was used later as a model? For other people, like, for example, Jean Clouet uh, for Marguerite d'Angoulême, I, I hope you went to see that in the show notes because remember I said there was a magnificent portrait. Well, she's holding a parrot too. And I'm, I'm just thinking, did this did this portrait of Mary Tudor start this trend? Oh, that would be exciting to think about, right? What do you think? Wow. <laughs> it's quite possible. It's, they've certainly moved from the um, margins of illuminated manuscripts into 
portraits and table oh well table panels which um and those that means when i say table that means a big portrait as opposed mm -hmm. to a miniature and mm -hmm. uh, become far more public but it still would have had a very limited audience you'd have only been the great and the good and possibly the family that would have seen them so are they marriage portraits are they basically saying that these very powerful women um mm -hmm. <clears throat> have a a pet parrot but also because the parrot speaks with a human voice and was thought to say the word of god they are actually representing the virgin on earth it's all possible there's so much debate around it we just don't know yeah i wish I painted parrots could could speak because then they would tell us right in these portraits uh and they great. look they <laughs> look at great. they look as though they're about to speak don't they <laughs> Yeah. Um, the one thing I do know is that the one the one people who are making a lot of money out of it would be the merchants. Oh, for sure. The, the merchants yeah. were making a lot of money with many things when this a lot the Spanish alliance we were talking about was going on between the Tudors and the Trastamaras for sure. And that shows in the records in Spain and the records in England too. There's a lot of licenses it, and not only merchants but also people connected uh, to the court in many other levels like humanists. Mm -hmm. Humanists were exporting wine, importing wool. So we have to thank merchants, but also other people that were uh, involved in this. Um, and speaking of uh, the symbolism of the animals in, in portraiture, which is something that we're going to talk about today. I was thinking, I, I kept thinking about the, the right and left hand, probably because, as I told you before, I'm left-handed, so I think a lot about this. <laughs> and I was thinking, in the case of Mary, in the portrait of Mary Tudor, which I'm proposed that Mike could be the original portrait that inspired others. Um, she's holding it in her right hand. That's what the inventory tell us. But maybe then we she see... was left-handed. Maybe she was. I'm not sure mm. about that. Oh, that would be interesting if someone had information about that, if she wrote with her left or her right hand. Um, because, you know, left-handed are special people. <laughs> <laughs> right, Rebecca? <laughs> we are very special. Now I wonder, is that something that's ever referenced? I don't in, know. Like, have you ever, Mel, in your research over the years, nope. have you ever come across any reference of right-handed or left-handed? Nope. No. Nope, never. Uh -uh. I'm sure someone out there must know. Yeah, if you do, reach out. I want to. I want to know more now. I'm interested. I want to know how many well, left-handed. I can think about. <laughs> <laughs> like. Was Mary Tudor left-handed? That would explain a lot. <laughs> But we did see that at least for some reason, in some cases, the women have these animals in their left hand, which we said it's not, seems to be odd, right? And there has to be an explanation for this. We saw it in the double portrait of Isabel Clara Eugenia and Catalina Micaela in the Royal Collection Trust. And I remember I mentioned that uh, Catalina Micaela was, um, Isabel Clara Eugenia, sorry, was very uh, important. And I want to mention Rafael Tornel, who is the person studying these uh, infantas in Arte Poder y Genero, um, because the other day I didn't mention his name and he's doing wonderful work. He's found, he's, he's, he's got some surprises for you guys in the future. He's, he's got a great a future ahead of him. Um, but in the case, uh, Isabel Cara Eugenia is holding it in her left hand. And then we have a portrait of, going back to Mary Tudor, because I'm obsessed with Mary Tudor, now I want to know if she was left-handed. But what we do know <laughs> is that um, in the portrait in Maline, she was holding this parrot in her right hand, but there's a portrait of um, attributed to Anthony Moore of a woman, and let's remember Anthony Moore painted Mary Tudor holding a red rose in an iconic portrait in the Prado Museum in Madrid, right? Well, this woman, uh, painted by the other woman, painted by Anthony Small in a portrait in Glasgow in the uh, Hunterian Museum. She's holding a parrot in her left hand too, and it's the same model as the portrait of Mary Tudor in the Brother Museum. Whoa! Wow! I know. It's a lot of information, but it makes sense. I hope <laughs> this is why yep. I'm so intrigued about this portrait and the portrait itself. Right, Melanie, we've been talking about it's. It's got many mysterious things about it that are very fascinating. Maybe Melanie can tell you more about this. The, is this the one? Uh, uh, I can't pronounce her. Van Herrick's portrait. Mm. The one the, in Glasgow. Yeah. The one in Glasgow, the Hunterian, the one by mm -hmm. Antonis Moore, fifteen sixty four. Mm -hmm. Um, I had a the name rang a bell. The surname rang a bell, and. 
I started digging and discovered that there is in the Moritz house a portrait by Antonius Moore of Stephen van Herrick, who was in England in 1565-67. He's a medalist, he's a sculptor, he's yeah. a gem engraver, and his portrait is dated 1564, and it's an oil on panel. And he's facing to the right, mm -hmm. and I wondered whether or not it was the pair of the one of the lady holding the parrot up in the Hunterian. What I don't know um, is whether that Stephen Van Herrick is painted on mahogany, because mm -hmm. if it is, that could well, well, that would prove absolutely that it's the, the pair to go with the one in the Hunterian. Can you clarify that? Because I think we haven't mentioned specifically why mahogany rings such a, such a bell to us. Well, that it's a South American wood. Mm. So it comes from the New World. And again, you know, you, you immediately think of the Spanish because if it's down in the South, it's, you know, in the Amazon, which is where it comes from, or in fact, the central forests of Central America, uh, you're going to have, you know, beautiful new woods coming in. Did they think instead of Baltic oak, oh, good heavens, let's try this as, you know, for, to paint a portrait on? Well, it was a bit that was left over, but it's the first time I've come across any portrait painted on mahogany at all. You wow. know, the Italian ones on lime wood, the English ones often on Baltic oak or English oak mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because it has a nice straight grain. It doesn't split or crack mm -hmm. unless you hang it over a radiator and it all goes, dries out and does terrible things. But um, it's the, the only painting I've ever seen painted on mahogany. I have in good authority uh, that it is not very common. It is extraordinary yeah. that this painting is painted in this chronology. And let me give you, let me throw in some more mystery in here. Actually, they did some infrared on the painting and they found out the, the date is dated. That's why we, we are saying yeah. 1564. But it seems to the, after the infrared, it could be 1554 instead of 1564. So 10 years previously. So previous. And then the other thing is the sitter's age is also included, as uh, Antonis Moore would do sometimes. Oh, and Holbein, let's remember, more famously. And everybody. Right um, the way to Hilliard. Yeah, and, and her age is 42. So she was born around the same time as Mary Tudor, um, for sure, because if, the, if it's dated in 1556 and uh, she's 42, uh, you do the math, um, that's incredible. You know, that to me was incredible. So I'm thinking, did this parrot arrive with the piece of wood that then was used to paint a portrait of someone? Could be. It could be. I mean, if if it's, uh, it well, Antonis Moore is associated with the court. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got a parrot. You've got somebody who is, you know, an incredible. Well, if it is Van Herrick's wife, mm -hmm. I mean, this is somebody who is incredibly skilled Mm -hmm. And also, if he's having Antonius Moore paint his portrait, mm -hmm. he's also pretty wealthy. Yeah, so exactly. he could well have, um, you know, he could well be involved in them, you know, with the merchants and mm -hmm. doing all sorts of other things and deals with them. I mean, mm -hmm. my thing is always follow the money. Mm -hmm. And we all, we, you know, everybody wants to better themselves and show how posh they are and how rich they are. So my wife was painted on a piece of mahogany. And what's more, I have this wonderful parrot. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I've tried very hard to identify that parrot. And I have no idea without that painting being cleaned as to mm. whether it's a new world or an old world parrot. Mm -hmm. Well, But if it could be an old world parrot, it could be from anywhere, including New Zealand. Oh, well, ladies, mm. let's stop talking about parrots. That's enough. <laughs> I want to talk about some other animals that yes. I've, I've come across. And I'm going to begin with a portrait. I'm looking at this now. It's a portrait of three young Elizabethan children. Mm, mm -hmm. It says the girl is age seven. She's in the middle with her younger mm -hmm. brothers, ages five and six on either side of her. Now, mm -hmm. the youngest brother has his arm through his sister's arm mm -hmm. and he's he's holding and like squeezing a bird in his right hand. And the, the interesting part to me is that the sister is holding what looks like a guinea pig. Now, okay, what do we know about guinea pigs? Do they symbolize anything and how common 
were they in England at this time? They weren't. I mean, they come from the New World. They come from Peru. Huh. They're not in the best juries. They come from Peru. The Incas, who were the indigenous uh, people of Peru, um, used to eat them as a delicacy. Uh, but, you know, if it, it here, it, I think it has much, 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 much more sim symbolic meaning. Um, Emma, when did the Spanish conquer conquer Peru? It was, was oh. it the mid 16th century because it wasn't it uh, Cortes or Pizarro? Uh, Cortes, um, definitely Mexico in 1520. Uh, oh, Melanie, why are you doing this to me? I can't remember now. I was yeah, after. I, uh, uh, I would say 1540s probably. Yeah, it's, Please it's, correct it's, me if I'm wrong. Yeah, <laughs> Someone. That, that portrait is, is Elizabethan, isn't it? Yeah. So yeah. for me, when I looked at it and I thought, good heavens, uh, a guinea pig, this to me suggests a recusant family. Mm. They are, you know, if it's Elizabeth on the throne, they're very quietly showing that because of their adherence, you know, to the Catholic faith, a guinea pig comes from Spanish lands, <laughs> and it's very subtle. Just why the why the younger brother is throttling that small poor bird? He's <laughs> so tightly held; he looks so <laughs> squashed. He doesn't you look just... like he's not gonna. He looks intense. He looks like he's hot. what kind of bird is it? Do you know, Melanie? Don't know. I, there's um. A colleague down in Australia, a lovely lady called Heather Dalton, has done a lot of um, research on the Bristol, Bristol Project, and she mm -hmm. discovered that there was a merchant who tried to bring back hummingbirds. And the the guy bringing them back on the ship couldn't feed them, and they all died. So, I mean, they're tiny. But I think that possibly not a hummingbird, but mm -hmm. possibly equally as a small bird from, from the same part of the world. But hummingbirds, um, he came, brought them back into the country stuffed with straw because he mm. thought they were too good an mm. opportunity to show the wonders and delights of the new world and sort of say, hey, guys, look what we're missing out on. We need to get there. I have a question. So could it be a goldfish finch? Uh... I looked at that. and It hasn't got the flash of red on the head because mm. I thought, ah, is it a goldfinch? Because that would definitely seal it as a Catholic image. Okay, because there's a portrait of Catherine of Aragon holding a goldfinch painted by really? Michel Sita. Yes, yes, it's in mm. Berlin. Yes, in Berlin, right? Okay. Um, and that is uh is paired with a portrait of uh well said to be used uh, a Spanish ambassador called Diego de Guevara, who was involved with uh, people like uh uh Margaret of Austria too. And yep. he was a great art collector and he collected works by Bosch and other leading artists. He had mm. the uh, Arnolfini, um, uh, what's that? Uh, yeah, the, Arn it? the Van Eyck Arnolfini portrait. Yes, he, he owned that. And, it here. Mm -hmm. yep. So, uh, and he was depicted in this uh, uh, other portrait that is paired with this portrait of Catherine of Aragon as the Virgin Mary. And she's holding a goldfinch. Yes. That would tie in with Raphael's Madonna of the Goldfinch. Oh, yes, it would. With the Goldfinch it? down in, in Italy. I'm glad I included that in my dissertation then. <laughs> 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 and the, but the magnificent thing mm. about this uh, portrait of Catherine of Aragon holding this bird, which is not an exotic animal, but very, very symbolic, right? Um, is that it's, uh, we know it's her because it's the same model as the model that is in the Vienna in the Kunsthistorisches Museum, labeled today as Mary Rose Tudor, uh, sister of Henry VIII. Um, it's the same model. And there's a third one in Detroit. Maybe just, uh, Rebecca and I can can drive there sometime in the, in the future. Yes. Uh, and uh, <laughs> or fly better. Yeah, I think it's like an eleven-hour drive at least. <laughs> she, was, she was looking at me like you. You still don't know the distances here in America, do you? I'm like, no. <laughs> we'll fly there. It's a first flight. Um, and yeah, and the, there's a third one there in Detroit, and she's holding a perfume bottle, and she's depicted also as, in this case, as Mary Magdalene. 
Uh, and it's the same That's model. That's by Sitao as well, isn't it? Yes, the, yeah. all of them are by the same painter. And uh, in that in that sense, I wanted to say, I know this is a very controversial uh, portrait uh, because, you know, it's been proposed to be, traditionally it was thought to be Catherine of Aragon now that was challenged some years ago. But the thing is, Matthias Veninger, who is the uh, who is one of the leading um, um, people who studies uh, Michel Sitao, uh, said that the in the case of the Assumption of the Virgin in in Washington D.C. in the National Gallery of Art, it's mm. the same model. The woman uh, that is the Virgin in the Assumption of the Virgin there in Washington D.C. is the same model. Well, this was painted for Isabel of Castile in fifteen hundred. That could not be Mary Rose Tudor, who was born in 1496. Who would have made the um, attribution of, of it being a Mary Tudor? Uh, <laughs> Matthews. Matthews, in uh, he published... Uh, the, the reason why, um, and it's not a bad proposal, but the reason why is because Mary Rose Tudor was betrothed to uh, Charles V, yeah. and yeah. Um, she received... Uh, one jewel with a K uh, in, in representation of Carolus, which is, you know, like Catherine of Aragon in Spanish, we write it with a C, but in English it's with a K sometimes. With Charles V happens the same thing. Yeah. In Spanish, we say Carlos with a K, with a C. In, 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 the, in, the, um, in some of his uh, jewels, it's with a K. But Catherine of Aragon had thousands of Ks made for her over the years. So for me, it's not a, a, enough reason. Uh, the other reason why it's because of the dating uh, of the portrait. It's before it was dated by Friedlanda around 1505. Yep. That would make sense uh, if it's Catherine because it's around the time she was ambassadress and 20 years old. And we have to think of the age of the person, right? In the case of the new uh, date, it's because of uh, comparative analysis. And that's great until you have other evidence, okay? That's what yeah, I, my but... point of view is. Maybe it's a historian coming out of the art historian there, but um, comparative analysis of style is good, but I think facts and documents and, and other things are better in the sense when, when you when you're trying to, to solve a mystery like this, right? Yeah. We, we will never know. The first... Emma, wouldn't you say the first thing to do is to look at the dates of the individuals that are that are alleged to being have being portrayed? So, for me, the fact that Catherine in fifteen oh five is, you know, she is what twenty coming up for mm -hmm. sixteen seventeen. In fifteen oh five, she'll be twenty years old because she was born she's in twenty. 15, yeah, fourteen eighty five. Right, so she's twenty. I mean that 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 to me is it's it that's almost a no brainer. Well, for me, one of the most definite uh, reasons is because Sita worked for her mother for 10 years. Oh, well, that's <laughs> another no-brainer as well. <laughs> yeah, and then she mentions him specifically in 1505 when she's in London and involved right. in the commission of another portrait. Um, and then she has a very, very close relationship to Margaret of Austria when Sita works for her. Right. And she is she's the one to negotiate the marriage between Mary Rose Tudor and Charles V. So Charles of Asburg at that time. So even if it's not Catherine, Catherine most probably commissioned that portrait. If not, yeah. if it's Mary Rose Tudor, Catherine of Aragon would still be involved because yeah, it's around, you know, she was the one to negotiate that marriage. So I think we, we're going off the topic. Though, going to the animal, off the sorry. Topic. Yeah. No, no, that's I started okay. talking about Catherine of Aragon and you know me. Oh, um, I get it. Going, yeah. back, going back to that triple portrait, apart from the fact yeah. that children are very clearly related, and they clearly. are very, mm -hmm. very similar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, the father must have, when his firstborn was a daughter, his heart must have sank. Right. Which, <laughs> but <laughs> um, there is, it, it, to me, it's, it's a very sweet portrait. You know, the fact that you've got these two um, animals in it is just, sort of a plus but there's another one that you've got yes then, which okay. is uh, the 10th earl of cobham yeah so i was <laughs> looking through all these different portraits of course i just did a google search of like exotic animals or animals and tutor portraits and stuff like that and i ran across one. i've seen this one before mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. i really i want to talk about this one um because I saw this strange creature in this portrait of William Brooke and his mm. family. And there's really a lot going on in this painting. There's like there a, a brood of children. 
Uh, there's a small bird. It looks like there's a parrot on the table, but there's one more animal that's in si it's sitting in front of the youngest daughter. It's actually sitting on her plate, which is a bit alarming, <laughs> but, mm -hmm. but that's beside the point. What on earth is this creature? And if you're listening and you're not looking at the painting, I'm going to describe it real quick because it looks like a cross between a black cat and a monkey. Whatever. I want one of those. <laughs> Whatever it is, you just described my ideal animal. And it's small. It's yes. the size of a kitten. Isn't it? It's no, I, tiny. Uh, yeah, I think it's a marmoset or a tamarind. Again, oh. from the New World, it's from South America. And the tamarinds and the marmosets have this sort of bushiness mm. around mm. their faces. But it, the painting needs a jolly good clean. Mm. Oh, maybe <laughs> that's that why. Would, okay. That would reveal an awful lot. Yeah. And again, the parrot stomping around the table. <laughs> Small business owners, let's talk taxes. Did you know you could save up to 30% when you file with Block Advisors instead of a typical accountant? Block Advisors by H&R Block provides affordable tax expertise that finds every credit and deduction your business deserves. 100% accuracy guaranteed. Schedule an appointment today at blockadvisors.com slash smallbiz. Average savings based on national average fees for Federal Form 1040, plus Schedule C and one state filing in the latest available 2020 survey conducted by the National Society of Accountants. Pricing may vary. See blockadvisors.com slash guarantees for full details. Coming to Apple TV Plus on January 26th. We came from every corner of the country to bring the war to Hitler's doorstep. Starring a stellar cast led by Academy Award nominee Austin Butler, Callum Turner, and Anthony Boyle. You'll be in charge of 350 air crewmen, boys who have yet to experience combat. Let's rack them up and knock them down. From the executive producers of Band of Brothers and the Pacific. I'm going to bet on anything. I'm going to bet on us. Masters of the Air, only on Apple TV+. Plus. <laughs> parrot? <laughs> really? Yeah. That's true. He's like in the forefront. The parrot is not yeah. He's clearly the protagonist of the show. But you're right. It's such a busy portrait. It's It's got so many things to it. I wonder if those uh, fruits that appear to are, you know, somewhat uh, the things like it looks like there's some sort of, I don't know, people will be able to judge I think that, you know what, now that I'm looking at this, uh, I do think that's a marmoset that looks very similar to the one. Uh, there's a portrait, full-length portrait of a lady in the Royal Collection Trust believed to be Margaret Tudor, and she's holding. <gasps> yes. There you go. I'll do so, a side-by-side -side on those. Yes, we must. He does look like he's wearing something covering his mouth. Maybe, that yeah, I think the it's the cleaning. That, that, that yeah. the marmosets and the tamarinds have. Yeah, and yeah. I, I saw them saw them years ago as a child in Jersey Zoo, and they're tiny. They're about that big. You know, they, they are literally the size of a kitten. Oh, yeah. They dash all over the place, and you can imagine sitting at the table, it would be rushing forward and grabbing something and and possibly even trying to grab the parrot's tail. I mean, it, it must have been a hell of a household. <laughs> yeah. I mean, noisy. <laughs> That's what I want. Chaotic. <laughs> you look at this table and you go, well, I know this is painted to portray something, right? This isn't mm. what their normal meals look like. Right. With a parrot right. Exactly. Running all over. <laughs> and and be, um, what you were saying about the, the similarities, sometimes painters do do this on purpose. For example, yeah. when Charles II of Spain is married to Maria Luisa de Orleans, she is depicted looking like him, which is weird, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, so we have to always be cautious when we when we look at these paintings, because I think this mom looks too fresh for this amount of children she has. <laughs> yeah, was it was it wife number one, two or three? How many how many times was William McCobble married? <laughs> oh goodness. No, don't don't quiz us so much today, Melanie. <laughs> oh I don't know, but he definitely was busy for some time. Yeah, looks like she was shelling peas. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you'll be interested too, and I was looking at more about this painting, that the one woman in it is Elizabeth Brooks. And I couldn't quite figure out if this was the same Elizabeth Brooks that was with William Parr. Mm. Ah. You know which one I'm Wait. referring to? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Weren't so they lovers? Weren't, wasn't, and then they were married, and then married. Anyway, that's a different subject. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, I thought you would <laughs> find that. <laughs> Another episode. Another episode. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so this marmoset, this cat slash monkey sitting on this kid's plate, are we alarmed that it's sitting on her plate or is this just... I don't know. Modern audience probably is, but they I doubt they would have been then. It um, looks very, very Instagram ready. I think you're right about <laughs> this is not real life. This household was no. not did not look like this usually. But clearly <laughs> it, it's it's I mean, it's it's a joke, but no, I think it's just to show the symbolism, to show their status. They're showing all these things they have um so that's why i think and in that case it's probably because it's so dark it does need to sit on the table you're otherwise you're not going to see it <laughs> this this is true and i love that you mentioned the symbolism because let's talk about symbolism a little bit too why is it so important and explain how the animals who are present um in portraits relay information and i'm going to move forward to another portrait because now i'm looking at a holbein one that oh. people might recognize as, I think it's titled like unknown woman with a squirrel or something like that. Oh. What's the importance of symbolism in, even in this portrait? Well, well in, all, it's an English squirrel because it's red. Mm. And um, mm. they they are, uh, one of Elizabeth's symbols was a squirrel. And that was because they they cash, you know, they're, they're, they're fruit, frugal. You know, they're, they're, you know, they will, they're very good with money. Maybe she was good with money, but there's also a starling on there. Yes. And, that's and in this case, that mimic. The, the presence of the starling and the squirrel combined has led some scholars to Honest propose that it could be from the Lovell family. Yeah. Because both the squirrel, these animals are both present in that, um, in that, in their coat of arms. So that's why it's been proposed that uh, it could be someone. And then the Lovell family are really important in the introduction of Renaissance. So it's no surprise that someone from that family would be portrayed by Holbein. This is one of my favorite portraits of all time, by the way. I just, uh, here in the Minneapolis Institute of Art, we have a, a portrait of in the, the 18th century following this model too. So it was influential. We know that other artists uh, imitated this because honestly, the headdress she's wearing I don't know if you've ever seen this portrait live. Yes, I have. It's oh. it's in the current Holbein exhibition at the Queen's Gallery. Oh, it's, it's breathtaking, it's isn't it? It's breathtaking, but it's a very strange headdress. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You, know, it's you, a... you immediately think of it, that, was it painted in the winter? Because that looks as though it could well be white rabbit fur. fur. Oh. oh, could it? You know what yeah. the, the dress, the way she's dressed reminds me of, Melanie? Mm-hmm. A certain a miniature portrait of uh, Susanna Horenboot in uh, the Conservatoire's <laughs> museum, uh, and this yep. is uh, these are two miniature portraits painted by Holbein, and uh, they're matching, and it's a it's a man I and it's a woman. Wine. Yep, and That's... he's wearing a royal uh, library of Henry VIII, so we know he was a servant of Henry VIII, mm -hmm. and she has the the portrait of the woman has been put in relation to Susanna Horenboot, the first it's... female artist on record in 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 well the first one of the first so i'm gonna it's... challenge you on that one <laughs> <Ooh>! <laughs> do yeah, it I'm, 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 I'm offering. We, you know um we don't have any any records of susanna being being paid by by the royal purse but i i love that pair that's in it's um it's in the me, case of in the case of really sofonisba anguisola who it was a painter for uh, the Queen of Spain and her husband, the king, she doesn't appear in the payroll either because she's a lady of the queen. So they they weren't paid because they, they didn't receive a wage, but she painted them. She painted the king and the queen. Oh, she painted and... the king and the queen. Um, yeah. Wasn't she employed uh, to teach um, Elizabeth de Valois how to paint? Exactly. So yeah. my theory... Oh, I'm just going to drop it here. My theory is that Susanna was recruited to teach Mary Tudor how to paint because we know that at least Catherine of Aragon knew how to paint. In 1513, we know she's painting banners, standards, and all these things, and it has been proposed that she embroidered these for, for the Battle of um, uh, Flodden. Oh, Flodden. But when I went to the receipts, they're all painted. All the banners, everything are painted. They're not embroidered. So... Mm. And she admits to him to Woolsey that she's terribly busy making banners, and and these are painted. 
So I think that that's the reason why Catherine of Aragon recruited uh, the Horembouts to to go to Wales with um, with Mary and teach her um, and, and work in probably what was a very big part of Mary's household in Wales was the musical chapel. And I think the Horembouts were involved in this, in the illumination of these books that they were using in this musical chapel of, of yeah, Mary Tudor. Yeah. yeah. It makes perfect sense because Susanna wouldn't have required to have been chaperoned, you know, no, as, as uh, sitting there and teaching teaching the young princess and also painting portraits of Catherine, particularly the one of, I'm going to bring it up now, that one with a monkey. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say a parrot for a second there. No, 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 no. I'm almost getting fed up with parrots. But... <laughs> yes, me too. <laughs> no, but the one with the monkey. Small. Yeah, that yeah. small square one, which is in the Buclou yeah. collection, when she's, mm -hmm. and you can almost see the two women, because uh, it's mid mid fifteen twenties, and you can see mm -hmm. the two women sort of saying, "Well, you know, I have this pet monkey. It comes from the, uh, you know, it comes from or well, the Spanish the Spanish main, if you like, mm -hmm. if you're a pirate, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and uh, we know that that it that it caused havoc." Uh, as it bounded around the court. And it's actually wearing a, a belt and it's chained to her. Mm -hmm. But I think it's got much, much deeper symbolism than that. Oh. For the timing. And mm -hmm. the delicacy of that portrait. And there's a panel version, which is not quite as good in, in Russia. Mm -hmm. We won't get to see that for some time at the moment. And mm -hmm. you can almost see that Susanna and Catherine... Um, coming together and saying, right, I have this problem. Henry's eye is roving. How do I tell the women of the court not to touch my husband? And Susanna, who was oh. steeped in medieval symbolism, and monkeys are known to be lustful. I mean, that's in all the, all the best stories, they all say monkeys are symbols of lust. Mm -hmm. Yes. And... So Susanna coming up with this idea, saying, "Well, you've got your pet monkey. Let's do him. You've got your you've got your crucifix. It shows your piety. Uh -huh. Let's have him sitting on your knee with with um, a belt round him and you holding a long lead. And then you can show this very quietly to any woman who's getting a bit too close to Henry, which says in the fifteen twenties." In the mid fifteen twenties, <laughs> I'm not going to mention names. You know, back off, madam. He is chained to me by the bonds of marriage. Exactly. We know that a certain lady was hated monkeys. She she mm. really really loathed them, and um, I think it's Woolsey who who documents the fact that this young lady really hates monkeys. I did and not know that Anne Boleyn didn't like that monkeys. out the window. Mm. Anne Boleyn did not like monkeys. It would be a like very monkeys. subtle way of hmm. saying, just back off. I'm so interested. Yeah, it, it's, it's, they're intimate objects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't want to have a full-on row, do you? Unfortunately, escalated into that. But it would, could be a very quiet way of just giving a message. I'm just like, shocked that someone wouldn't like monkeys. Monkeys are amazing. <laughs> there's wow. a lovely, lovely. There's a lovely um, book of hours in the Bodleian, where and in the bottom of the page on a series of pages, there's a whole series of monkeys all dressing up and having a battle on a horse which has been made to look like a unicorn. Mm. Oh really? Oh yes, yeah. I've seen this. You're right. Yeah. And it's... and you know, thinking of the monkeys, and now that you mentioned the unicorn. I've seen a chain monkey before, um, not in a portrait, in a tapestry. Yep. And uh, in relation to the unicorn that, um, because we talk about all types of exotic animals, even the ones that don't exist, like, well, they, do they exist, unicorns? How because do we it, know? Maybe back they, in the day, they, they believe- Make it into the ark. Back in the day, when we were talking the other day about uh, Marco Polo and all these, uh, they did believe that uh, unicorns were real just like elephants because you know um we are in a pre-scientific world really um and because there was much that wasn't explored so if there is an elephant if you think about it, an elephant is a pretty extraordinary creature why not a unicorn which is 
basically a horse with a horn on its head. We all know what a unicorn looks like. I, I have a five-year-old, so my life is surrounded by unicorns right now. Um, <laughs> but I have been studying unicorns for a long time because unicorns are important in the sense of, of the symbolism that we were talking about because they represent Christ and because they're unique, they're, they're unique nature, uh, especially white unicorns were used in art to represent Christ. And they are prominent um, around the time of the turn of the century between the 15th century and the 16th century yep. in two very, very extraordinary sets of tapestries that um, have been proposed, at least the ones in Paris that we're going to talk about have been put in, into relation with the marriage of Catherine of Aragon and Arthur, Arthur Tudor. They're the ones at the Cluny. The Cluny ones Museum. in the Museum Cluny, yes. Yeah. Um, they are called the, well, the the Lady and the Unicorn series because as you know, tapestries usually are, well, usually no, most of them, the majority of times were created in sets telling a story and they were used in those, you know, castles and places where you would have celebrations to decorate the walls. And they were the most expensive. We talk a lot about paintings. We're obsessed with paintings. I'm obsessed with paintings. But tapestries were more luxurious at the time because not only of what they're representing, but also because they're made with silver thread, with gold thread mm -hmm. and things like that that are very valuable. Um, and they held a, a value because of the materials used, not because of the value we give to the artist's reproduction of it, right? And these tapestries, in the case of the Lady of the Unicorn that are in Paris, feature the story of a lady that tames a unicorn. And this is a very prominent story from the medieval times and it's featured in many manuscripts and other places. And um, the only way to capture a unicorn, and according to legend, is to have a maiden that will uh, wait for him, right? So this was used and this was proposed, uh, it's been proposed before, this was used as a way to represent Catherine's virginity which I know people are very concerned about <laughs> if Catherine was a virgin when after her marriage to Arthur. So it has been proposed that the, this set of tapestries, the first one we we're talking about, the one in Paris in the Musée Cluny, the Cluny were commissioned by someone to defend her Catherine's virginity after the death of Arthur Tudor. Because mm. this was controversial when Arthur died, not, not only now, at the time, it was also controversial because of the implications that it had for Catherine to be able to marry the, the new Prince of Wales, future Henry VIII. So I wanted to bring this up because there's, there's a chained monkey depicted in these. Yes. And there's also the unicorn and a lot of, and, and this is a lady that is coming with a big uh, treasure somewhere and there's a feast. And the most important thing about this proposal is like in the in one of the tapestries that it has the only inscription of all of them. It says, "Mon seul désir," my only desire. But uh, Marco Picard identified uh, an A and a K on each that, side. That to me is very compelling. I mean, mm -hmm. they think that that five of them represent the senses, mm -hmm. and the sixth mm -hmm. one, they're not quite sure what it represents. Mm. Are they? Well, but, Marco Picard uh, pro uh, proposed that it, it it's a reference to the marriage festivities between uh, Arthur Tudor and Catherine. Arthur and Catherine for, for that particular marriage. I mean, they. I think from the point of view of survival, the paintings, the panel paintings in particular, have survived over the years purely because they're either on wood or they haven't been eaten by mice. But tapestries are, you know, they're very prone to... Um, being eaten by moth, mm, mm -hmm. and that's that's why they they were hugely expensive. I mean, Henry yes. had several. I mean, the ones up in in Hampton Court, the stories of Abraham, which are in the Great Hall mm -hmm. there. The preservation work has been fantastic on them, mm -hmm. but that chained monkey in the Clooney ones, I'm I'm fascinated by that one because that to me it's it's a case of the chained desire. Mm -hmm. They were almost as they were holding back, mm -hmm. but um, you know that whole legend of it was only a pure, uh, pure virgin who could catch this fierce unicorn, mm -hmm. and she's set in a glade. Mm -hmm. Whether or not it, you know, you know, um, any any um, young woman who'd be sort of 
taken out on a hunt and been told in this court of chival chivalry love or chivalric love, right, we're going to hunt a unicorn. You can almost have um, a problem if she's sitting there in a glade and no unicorn comes along because unicorns could scent a virgin at about mm -hmm. 50 miles, apparently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so if no no unicorn came along, that sort of questions could be asked. Mm -hmm. Embarrassing ones. But, but that's just an aside if people really did think that they could catch unicorns. Could they or could they not? But they appear all over the place. And we'd all love to have a unicorn. Of course. I was in my Christmas list, but I didn't get it. <laughs> Darn it. <laughs> well, yeah. listen to this. I have studied Henry VIII's inventory of his paintings, and he had a painting, several paintings of people holding animals. Okay? Yeah. Usually ladies. And one of them is a lady holding a unicorn. So. I wonder where that ended up. I don't know. I know one portrait of a lady holding a unicorn uh, in the Galleria Borghese, painted by Raphael. Yes, you know I know about the one that? you're talking about. Yes. She, well, in this case, it's, this is a marvelous painting. You have to go and see this um, in the notes. And in this case, until the 19th century, I believe, it, it the unicorn wasn't um, there because this lady oh, in the 17th century, another painter painted over the Raphael and he painted her as Catherine of Alexandria, which by the way is Catherine of Aragon's saint patron. Um, so um, she was, so this was covered only when they did the restoration, they found the unicorn. It's a very baby unicorn as well. It's yes. tiny. I know, right? It's beautiful. It really is. It's lovely. But that, what? the the actual horn itself with the twist on it, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, there were several inventories um, of people owning unicorn horns, anything up to 10 feet long. So mm -hmm. you can see where the legend comes from. But where did they come from? They come from narwhals up right. in the Arctic. So they're rare dangerous to get yes and uh the royal collection trust has got um a, a, a triptych which has got st bernard of clairvaux and st benedict in it and their croziers if you look at it are twisted and they are unicorn horns mm -hmm. and they are flanking the virgin so it makes sense that you would have saints associated with the virgin mary having a unicorn's horn mm -hmm. as part of their croziers. Mm -hmm. They've been embellished. I have a question here. Like, how often, <laughs> this might be, you might not even be able to answer this, but we've always seen a unicorn as this mythical creature, right? Mm -hmm. So we have unicorns, and then, of course, the other thing that comes to mind are dragons. Mm -hmm. where, did the, where did these ideas come from? Because how did... How did anybody even come up with the idea to mm. paint a unicorn if it wasn't real? Or Traveler's even sails. Traveler's you can tales. imagine, you know, the sailor coming back from a from a voyage and sitting in the taverns, and you've got an apprentice yeah. from a from a you know um, an arts art workshop or an illuminating workshop, and he's down there, and they're all in their cups, and he says, "I was in the jungles of wherever, and there was this great big thing with four legs, and it had a horn." And it's mm. a rhinoceros. Uh -huh. You know that Dura did a, a yeah. produced a rhinoceros. He never saw it, and that had been sent from India as a gift to I think it was Manuel of Portugal, uh -huh. Uh -huh. and but and he he painted this from a from an oral description. Yeah, and it's it's pretty accurate. But when it comes to dragons, they appear in absolutely every single society between the capricorn and cap the tropics of capricorn and mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. cancer mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're in china they're in um yeah. wales they're in mm. uh central america they're everywhere yeah and they're, but they're always flying and winged creatures i love um, dragons so much uh, i think they're wonderful <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> i want a dragon too now uh so but it'd be so are... much cheaper for the central heating <laughs> <laughs> yeah but especially dragons are prominent because of the tutors comes from from wales and they use the dragon as their symbol and also because the patron saint of england is saint 
St. George. Uh, St. George. So St. the story of St. George of the Dragon, listen to this, the patron saint of Aragon, it's the same guy. So he, the story hmm. of St. George and the Dragon is very important in Aragon too. So there's a very, very cool uh, family portrait of the Tudors, the first Tudors, um, Elizabeth of York and Henry VII, um, and their children. And if you look at this um, painting, it's got a dragon in the, it's got a maiden, St. George, and the dragon. Um, and, and there's a and lot the of maiden. depiction. Yeah, yeah, there's the a lot of depictions. Has, yeah, the maiden has a, a sheep mm -hmm. or a goat on a string. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. th they all appear in as with wings, mm -hmm. apart from the Portinari altarpiece where you've got St. Margaret standing on what looks like a monkfish. There's a pretty fearsome head. Mm -hmm. And she, she escaped having been eaten by a dragon by cutting her way out with crucifix. Mm -hmm. And then there are two... A uh, books of hours by Benning, and mm -hmm. one book of hours uh, which is which is earlier than that, which has a dragon which has no wings. Mm. And I'm sure that that comes from travelers' tales of somebody out in either India, or had got as far as the Spice Islands and the island of Komodo, and talked about these huge great beasts that ate mm. people, because the Komodo dragon has been known to eat people. And yep. they're fearsome. And the, there's a blue monitor lizard, and it's fairly big in India. It's about five or six feet long. But a Komodo dragon can be up to 10 to 12 feet long. They're I huge. don't want one of those. No. <laughs> no, no, no. You don't want one of those. And they also have um, poison sacks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard about that. That's why yeah. I don't want one of those. <laughs> and that's why. <laughs> Yeah, that's why. Because I've got enough with my unicorn and my um. And it my was dragon. stick with unicorns. Yes, the coolest dragons I've seen in Spain, and I was remember when you were talking about this, are in in churches in the um, in they're decorating the um it, it, they're featured in the architectural um oh what do you call them? Mosaics. Um, no, no, no. They are in the uh. uh Bosses of the churches and the in the architectural uh, decorations, wow. they're yeah. featured there. They the they look very cool. And also what I was saying about Saint George and the Dragon, and and to be honest with you, the other day when we were talking about the Court of Isabel, I was looking at her books. She had books about the legends of Arthur, uh, and yeah. the Round Table. Uh, so Casper Aragon grew up reading the same stories for little girls that we're reading with dragons and princesses but she knew in this case she was one of them so um i'm sure that she commissioned many many paintings with with saint george and the dragon because it was not only it was a point of contact she had between aragon and england right yeah so, so i'm sure the dragon was was something she had um in her mind once in a while because of the symbolism everybody recognized also that it was uh a, a symbol of the new dynasty of the tutors that were coming from from wales and she remained very close to all those people that she met in wales too uh throughout her life as queen of england because she was a princess of wales for a long time let's remember that right so mm. those connections she made uh, when she was Princess of Wales for a long time, she she still had, and she lived in Wales. So it was a place that she knew. Whereabouts? She was lived in Ludlow. Her? She lived in Ludlow with um, Arthur. Yeah, but how long for? Well, about six months. But then she sends Mary there when Mary's uh, going to be... Uh, when she starts receiving her formal education in 1525, they send her to Wales. They send uh, their daughter to Wales. So she mm -hmm. always has a connection. She has lots of servants that come from there too and connections with, uh, there's several manuscripts that are linked to her too. That, uh, For example, there's one in the uh, in the National Library in, in Wales. And also there's her coat of arms is featured in, in some castles there too. So, I mean, she's she's important in She's in important Wales. down there. Yeah. Right. Yes. And uh, is it the red red dragon of Wales or is it... You know, in the, uh, what, one in the in that panel where you've got the children mm -hmm. of Henry Tudor, he's a green dragon with a white tummy. Yeah, 
Because this is the story told by Jacopo della Voragine in that famous book about the golden legend. Golden legend, yeah. Yes. So that's the story he's telling about the princess that was rescued for St. George. One thing is a red dragon from the Tudors and another thing is a story that we know, and this is the work done by my colleague Melania Soler Moraton in Arte Poder Genero again, um, shameless plug in there. Um, but this uh, story is very important for the daughters of Isabel of Castile and is in all her, their libraries too. So we know it's an important story for them. They would have learned about St. George of the Dragon from there. It's it's a story which so many artists actually visit. I mean, there's Vittorio Capaccio, Raphael, Raphael um, uh, Paolo Riuccello. I mean, there's a lot of the Italian artists actually mm -hmm. look at look at um, the dragons, and there are all sorts sorts of different dragons. So when people actually got to China, they must have had quite a shock because their dragons are completely different. And well, the ones I'm telling you about the churches in, in, in Castile, they look a bit like Chinese dragons, I want to say. Do they? I'm going to share a picture with everyone. So and I'll send you a picture, Rebecca, so you can put in the notes and then people can see. They're in several churches now. Uh, in the, uh, I'll look for them and we'll share them to see what people think about those. They're, they're very cool. Oh, you guys, I've so enjoyed this conversation today. <laughs> we covered such a wide base of things, and it's always such a pleasure to have both of you on the show. I know we could talk for like another hour, but let's just <laughs> let's just chalk it up to another episode together in the, in the future. Mel, sure. Emma, thank you so much for being here with me today. Thank you, Rebecca. It's, thank it's you, a pleasure. <laughs> it's always a pleasure to talk to you too. <laughs> If you are watching today and you've enjoyed this video or you're just listening to the podcast, be sure to subscribe because then you will be notified of future episodes. So thanks so much for joining us today. Until next time. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty.